Hello everyone, welcome back to Hot Seat. I'm Omid Mogalat joining you from Tehran. And once again, I'm so grateful and honored to have the chance to share this educational platform among my great friends as great educators, lecturers, researchers from around the world, who I'm so grateful, I have to say it always in every session, that they accepted the invitation to join me and join you all and share their experiences, their knowledge, their skills with all of you and help all of us to obtain better knowledge and understanding in treating our patients. And today, a very talented clinician, I'm so happy to call him a friend, is here with me. And I have to say, we talked about from so many aspects in implant dentistry, but this one is the hottest one and the newest one because we didn't have the discussion before. So I'm pretty excited myself about it. I'm pretty sure you all, Dr. Gonzalo Blasi is here with me. Hello, Gonzalo, and welcome to Hot Seat. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much and so happy to have you and so happy that you accepted to join. And you know, I think so many people are familiar with you and your family work and your research work. But I have to say it as we discussed a little bit earlier that Blasi's family is a, you know, like a triple thread. <laughs> they have, <a, laughs> have orthodontists, periodontists. So whatever you ask, they can do it. And I think... <laughs> Yeah, I think today's topic is going to be like a combination uh, and I can say like a teamwork treatment plan for a patient, which is the, I think, the perfection for a treat treatment for a patient. And the topic that he chose to present for us is about pre-orthodontic implant placement, how implant dentistry can enhance the outcome of orthodontics and how it can bring the better outcome for our patients. So I'm not going to talk about it. Actually, I'm excited about it. So I will let him talk about it completely. But before we start as a tradition of hot seat, I would like to have a short video of Gonzalo for all of you. And then uh, I will ask him to share the screen and we will enjoy his beautiful presentation. Dr. Gonzalo Blasi is a graduate of the American Board of Periodontology in the United States and has a certificate in periodontics and implants and a Master of Science in Oral Biology from University of Maryland in Baltimore. He has also completed a fellowship in implant prosthetics from the University of Maryland and has a degree in dentistry from the International University of Catalonia. He is also have a private practice in, Bar in Barcelona, if I'm right, right? That's right. Yeah, and if you Google him, you can find amazing presentations and lectures by him, also researches that also you can follow him on his Instagram page because he's active there also. So I'm pretty sure he will talk about a lot of for all of us. So Gonzalo, I'm so excited, my friend. Thank you again for joining and the platform is all yours and definitely we will have a great discussion at the end. Thank you so much, Omid. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you sharing uh, our work. And uh, I'm um, very happy to be with you today. Um, let me share my screen. There you go. All right. Can you see my screen? Perfect. Sorry about that. Well, um, again, thank you, Omid, for the, the invitation. And it's my pleasure to be here with you sharing a little bit of our work. And so today I'm gonna be talking about interdisciplinary dentistry and how the patient can benefit from three different specialties in reducing treatment time. Um, so before we start, uh, I, want to, to, I want to introduce you uh, to our team. Uh, we work with my dad who's an orthodontist and we also uh, have a, our sister who's a restorative dentist among other doctors, but the work that I'm gonna show you today, it's been done by my brother Ignatius, who's an orthodontist, who did his ortho training at the University of Pennsylvania, and my brother Alvaro, who's a prosthodontist, and he did his training in Augusta University. Both of them, they're diplomats of the American Board of Ortho and Pros. So um, we're very lucky to have this team because um, we can be working with different specialties under the same roof and, and our patients benefit from this 
Um, so moving on into interdisciplinary treatment and implant therapy in orthodontics, um, when we have adult patients that have to undergo orthodontic treatment, implants, and prosthetics, sometimes they see that the treatment time is going to be very long, and therefore they forbear or not accept this type of treatment because, as we said, it has increased treatment time and also increased cost. But we've, among us, we've been talking and, and discussed how we can the, be able to have better or more acceptance to treatment by adult patients that need orthodontic treatment. And we decided that maybe by changing the sequence of therapy, the classic sequence of therapy, we could reduce this treatment time and thus increase uh, patient acceptance. Because um, we, we know that by using implants during orthodontic treatment, we will have uh, better anchorage and, and better or more precise tooth movement. So this has been described previously in the literature. Um, it's been designed in, in an analogical way and also combining analogic and digital way. But anytime that you add uh, analogic to this type of, of planning, you have some room for error and you may have some uh, mistakes during the planning. So uh, we decided to do this in a way that we could do it all digital without involving any time of uh, PDS or silicon impressions just by scanning the patient with an intro scan. And so we developed what we call the digital POIP concept or pre-orthodontic implant placement that we published in the Journal of Aesthetic and Restorative Dentistry uh, last year. And so the benefits of what we'll call placing the implant before orthodontic treatment that we're gonna reduce treatment time because by the time that orthodontic treatment is finished, the implant is already integrated. We're gonna have better anchorage because we can use the implant as an anchorage once it's integrated. And then, which is very important is have a prosthetic uh, or a temporary prosthesis on this implant before orthodontic treatment is finished. Because what happens sometimes is the orthodontics does the work, remove the braces, debonds the patient, and all of a sudden you go ahead and place the implant and you have a very white space. And you put, and you have an ugly crown now. By placing the implant and have an implant integrated before ortho finishes, you can put a temporary crown and have a final vision of the prosthesis before debonding the patient. So you can actually close the space or open the space based on that temporary prosthesis. So how do we do it? How do we place the implant before orthodontic treatment? So we use digital technology, we use printed traits and printed uh, surgical guides. And so I'm gonna show you three cases. The first two cases, you're gonna see the planning and the execution. And on the third case, you're gonna see the initial situation, planning, execution, and one year follow-up. Um, so we'll start with the first case. Um, with this is the initial situation. You can see the patient has a, a midline that's deviated patient has a uh, deciduous molar on the third quadrant uh, that needs extraction. And she also gonna need uh, some um, orthognatic surgery. But our goal is to extract the tooth prior uh, and place an implant before starting orthodontic treatment. We also, we're gonna digitalize those molar on the fourth quadrant in, in order to uh, improve that midline. So, uh, we do our setup, orthodontic setup, meaning we we'll start moving the teeth digitally to know how the case is going to finish, to know the final position of each tooth once the orthodontic treatment finishes. So on the green image, you can see the initial situation. On the orange image in the middle, you can see the setup. And you can see that that second premolar is going to be placed more towards the distal. And then we superimpose those images. And then we transport that into our CBCT and do the planning. And based on this setup that you can see, 
the image is the um, uh, purple image or bluish image. Uh, that implant is going to be placed more towards the molar, uh, more distalized. So we plan that implant placement right where we did the setup and digital wax set. And we decide our surgical guide. And so we perform the extraction, place the surgical guide, implant placement. Uh, and we also do a connective tissue graft from tuberosity beyond the buckle to increase soft tissue volume. And on the image, on the ray graph on the right side, you can see the image, the implant placement perfectly aligned with the adjacent teeth, but a little bit tilt, uh, positioned towards the distal aspect. And now the patient is it ready to start orthodontic treatment and will wait three months in order to have the implant integrated. And after three months, we can position a temporary crown and use that implant as an anchorage. So second case, um, and this is a bit more complex case. Uh, this patient uh, presented to our office in order to have orthodontic treatment and an implant placed on the dental side of 16. Uh, you can see on this patient that presents with an anterior crossbite. Um, the patient also presents with a thin phenotype and gingival recession on number 13, 14, and 15. And we said, let's do a digital orthodontic setup in order to see how this case is going to finish. What type of movement we're going to need in order to give the patient a proper occlusion class one molar and class one canine. Um, and so, same thing as the case before, uh, initial situation in orange, digital orthodontic setup in green. Um, you can see the differences that we've corrected the midline and, and we've corrected the anterior cross pipe. And as you can see on the superimposition of both images, the teeth are going to be brought outside the alveolar housing by means of orthodontics. Right? You can see the green image more towards the buckle. And this patient already presents with gingival recession and a thin phenotype. So if we move the teeth outside the alveolar housing, the recession is in greater chance of increasing the depth. So the, the, the greater the depth of the recession, the lesser the chance we're going to have to achieve complete root coverage. And the more root prominence, the lesser the chance to achieve root, uh, complete root coverage. So we said, okay, so we're going to bring this teeth outside. Uh, we're going to also place an implant. Uh, as you can see, we did the di digital setup, uh, digital wax up on the dental site. And so we decided to do grafting before starting the orthodontic treatment. You know, to be able to move these teeth outside the outer housing and avoiding uh, damaging the periodontium or um, in having increased recession and increased heart tissue dehiscences. So we do also the planning, as we mentioned before, uh, the digital setup with the digital wax up. We plan our implant again a little bit more towards the distal um, based on, on, the, on the wax up and the setup. And you can see the CVCT on the, on the right side of the screen. And this is the sequence. Uh, we open a flap. We do uh, decortications. These are cuts into the bone in order to create what it's called a regional accelatory phenomenon. By doing these cuts, we're going to be able to create like an osteopenia. This is a demineralization of the bone. And so the, so the bone is going to become softer and teeth are gonna be able to be moved faster. We add a bone graft in order to correct the, the heart tissue dehiscences and penetrations that we had. And we also add a, a cellular dermal matrix in order to increase soft tissue thickness. And we can only advance the flap covering the recessions. On the image in the middle, you can see our surgical guide with the implant placement, occlusal view, you see the implants, position more towards the distal and we close the flap and you have the image of the ray graph on the right side. And so this has been the two cases with the initial situation, planning and execution. And now I'm gonna show you the third case with all the treatment finished with one year 
uh, follow up. So this is actually the case that we published. This uh, young lady that was concerned about the aesthetics of the lower uh, arch, the, specifically the lower anterior teeth. And you can see the patient uh, had a nice smile. She, she also had orthodontic treatment done in the past. Um, she had some upper premolar extractions due to that previous orthodontic treatment. But sadly, this patient had a car accident and lost one of her lower teeth, which is uh, number 32. And she's been wearing this temporary ugly prosthesis for a long time. And now she has decided to undergo uh, dental therapy. She's very afraid of the dentist. He, she said she has been a big step in her life in order to make this decision to go to the dentist and correct this because she's really scared and anxious to be doing this because of the trauma that she had with that car accident. Um, so analyzing the case, the patient, the patient has some mild crowding and the patient has um, that temporary prosthesis, some recession, we're going to take a, a a closer look at that uh, lower arch, specifically of the anterior teeth. Um, you can see we have recession on both central incisors. Um, number 31 has some uh, interproximal attachment loss on the distal, so this would be a Cairo type 2 recession, which means that we won't be able to achieve complete root coverage on this tooth. Um, that mild crowding, you can see. There are differences in, in the widths of the incisors because with that previous orthodontic treatment, the patient had stripping down. That's why um, number 41 is a little bit more um, narrow. And then uh, there's a slight recession on number 33, and we'll see that there's uh, some loss of volume or atrophy in, in that dental site where there's the missing number 32. So we'll take a look at the, at the lateral views and, and you can see that, that the, the um, deficiency of volume, not only soft tissue but hard tissue because of that avulsion or, or missing tooth. Um, you can see the, the recession present. The patient has a class 1 canine and a class 2 molar because the patient had an extraction done. And this is the uh, OPT. Um, we see that everything's within normal limits. The patient had some treatment done in the past with some tori in the lower arch that are not, not uh, involving our, our therapy. And so we have different options, treatment options. The conventional option would be number one, performing root coverage, soft tissue grafting, wait for healing, and then perform uh, orthodontic therapy. Once orthodontic therapy is finished, we place the implant, we do GBR, and we wait four to six months, and then stage two and crown, right? Um, second option would be ortho first, and then root coverage second, GBR, and final crown. The problem with this is that, as we will see on the setup, these things are gonna be procline, and they already present with recession and heart tissue dehiscence. So we mentioned before that if the teeth are brought outside the outer housing, the root coverage procedure is gonna be compromised, right? So it's better in this case to perform root coverage at the beginning. And the third option with pre-orthodontic implant placement concept would be do all surgical procedures at once, then orthodontic treatment and final crown. So we do root coverage of those teeth that have present with integral recession, we place the implant with uh, GBR, and we also do periodontally accelerated osteogenic orthodontics, meaning corticotomies, in order to uh, increase the speed of tooth movement and or in order to reduce treatment time. Because we know this patient mentioned that everything has to be done by IV sedation because of her anxiety, and she has the less number of procedures done. Um, so we decided to go with this uh, option, which is the third option, right? So we do the, the orthodontic setup to start moving the teeth, uh, proclining those uh, 
teeth, we do the reduction, interfaction reduction or stripping, and we start moving teeth until we have the midline corrected and uh, the planes of occlusion as well. And we decide, we design the final prosthesis. And we know we take the contralateral tooth and we do a mirror image and we place it at the dental site. And so we now have the orthodontic setup with the digital wax setup. And now we export that into our CBCT. And so we superimpose our setup with our CBCT and we start planning the implant on its ideal position based on the um, orthodontic setup. But while designing, when we design the surgical guide, the surgical guide has to fit on our initial model, right? So the implants can be planned on based on the setup, but the digital guide is gonna be planned based on our initial situation, right? So we see, we place our implant and we design our surgical guide, and we also do bracket placement digitally. We put our, the brackets in the ideal position in order to create this uh, trace to cement the braces. And so we create the upper and lower um, trays in order to cement and do everything digital. So they increase the precision as much as possible in this case. So we, we invested a lot of time in the computer, but we reduce a lot of time in the chair which also means that we economize the time of the, of the treatment. So these are the printed trays, the printed model, and the pr printed uh, surgical guide. And so we put the surgical guide in and we see that there's perfect fit. We remove the surgical guide. We do this obviously before starting the treatment. Um, and then we do our incision design. We do two vertical incisions on the canines, we do so marginal incisions on the incisors so that uh, we're gonna totally advance the flap in order to perform root coverage procedure. And we do a crestal incision on the dental side. Once we do our incisions, we do a full thickness flap and we do our decortications with a high speed. And we also do some corticotomies on where the implant is gonna be to enhance angiogenesis for our GBR, right? So as we mentioned before, these decortications are gonna enhance the orthodontic movement. We use this in patients that have complex uh, type of movements like intrusion or distalization of molars or um, proclination or um, missile or distal angulations and also on teeth that are Periodontal, um, patients that are periodontally susceptible that are already present with tingular recession or heart tissue dehiscence, as we can see on these two central incisors. So we do our decortications as we mentioned before. We put our surgical guide in, we do our drilling, and we have our pin, and we take an x-ray. And this is where you can become a little nervous because you're gonna have to trust on your planning because as you see on the x-ray, the implant is completely tilted to the distal, to the canine. And um, you have to, as I said, be confident and, and trust on your planning. You can see the implant placement on the image on the left side. And we can see that there's a, a heart tissue dehiscence as we knew already from our planning on our CBCT. Um, and so, we're gonna do and perform GBR around this, this implant. We also harvested a free gingival graft that we DPTLized extraordinarily um, and we sutured it on the incisors that presented with um, gingival recession in order to not only achieve uh, root coverage, but also to change the phenotype of the patient and increase the thickness and be able to move these teeth in a safer way and bring the teeth and procline them and avoiding increasing the, the gingival recession by doing that this movement. We grafted the area with FDBA, mixing it with uh, GEM21, and we use a collagen membrane uh, over the implant. This collagen membrane also has a bone graft underneath, and we fixed this membrane with some mini screws. We could also use some uh, periosteal sutures to fix it. This is a matter of initial preference, 
but the implant is already placed and um, orthodontic treatment is ready to start. So we could only advance uh, the flap. You can see we left some connective tissue graft exposed on, on tooth um, number 41. You, ha you have to bear in mind that this tooth is lingualized and there's some minor crowding in this area. So adapting the flap at this area may be some, we may face with some difficulties and we achieve uh, primary wound closure. We use a horizontal mattress with a PTFE, 4 0 PTFE suture, and we did simple interrupted sutures with proline, uh, polypropylene, and we did some sling sutures in order to advance the flap on the two um, center incisors. So this uh, case finished, well, the surgical part of the case done, um, and now we move on and cement the braces with the, um, the, switch, the trace, printed trace. So we want to place the brackets the earliest, as earliest as possible in order to be able to um, maximize the regional accelerator phenomenon because this osteopenia that or demineralization that we've caused with our court economies, it's going to be temporary. There's a time frame that we we need to uh, start moving teeth uh, the earliest as possible. So we, we cemented the braces and at one week follow up, the braces are already in place and the orthodontic treatment already started. Um, and so you can see um, there's a healing within normal limits. We, it appears that we achieved a nice uh, result, although it's too early to tell. But on the crystal aspect, we see that there are no uh, the hissings of the soft tissue, the, he the healing is, as I mentioned before, within normal limits. And um, we move on and start moving teeth. You can see that uh, that um, tooth uh, number 41 doesn't have a bracket in place because it couldn't be placed uh, because of the minor crowding. Once teeth are a little bit more aligned, we'll be able to place a bracket on that tooth. Um, and this is just a four months follow up. We have complete alignment and we take an x ray, and now the implant is completely aligned and parallel to a, the adjacent teeth. The implant didn't move, just the teeth were moved accordingly to our orthodontic setup. And this implant is already integrated, and we're ready to uh, open a flap and put a temporary crown on this implant. And we perform good coverage and we reduce the treatment time in orthologic treatment by mostly half because of that, those peak critications. Um, and so we're ready to do stage two. We open a small flap and we can see we were successful on our GBR. We have increased uh, our bone uh, width on the buckle more than 1.5. This is how much we need according to the latest study by, by Monke. And um, we also can see some bone angles into the cover screw. So we actually had to remove some bone on top of that screw in order to remove the cover screw and put a healing abutment. Um, so we also took the, the advantage of this uh, second stage to do a connective tissue graft from the tuberosity in order to increase a little bit the volume and the final aesthetics of, of the final crown. You can see we, on, on the image on your left side that we had increased some volume with, a, uh, with our previous GBR, but we know that by adding that uh, soft tissue graft, we're going to improve the aesthetics uh, much more than just with the GBR. Um, so we did that, and this is the final crown placed, and you can see the axis, uh, the chidney of, of the uh, ceramic crown that is on the lingual, that is centered on the crown. And uh, this is the x ray uh, at one month, uh, sorry, at one year with the uh, crown in place. You can see we, we left the uh, mini screws uh, because we didn't want to be too invasive and we know the patient has some anxiety issues. I don't think there's a problem by, by doing that. And um, this is the final image a one year follow up with the final prosthesis in place, uh, the alignment, and you can see the increase in soft tissue thickness by means of that uh, connective tissue graft from tuberosity. 
and also this is the final image of the case finish at one year with a complete uh, uh, vision of the case. So we were able to achieve many things at one shot by digital planning with all our team, with the orthodontist, the restorative dentist, the periodontist, or the implant surgeon. Uh, we were able to place the implant, uh, have the implant with GBR, have the implant integrated, doing the orthodontic treatment. We were able to put a temporary crown on that implant, use that implant as an anchorage, have a reference or a vision of the final um, prosthesis with that temporary crown, and then put a definitive, definitive crown or final crown on that implant. So we place the, if, if we had chosen the first options that we dis discussed at the beginning with a conventional way, we would have had increased the treatment plan or the treatment time by uh, nine months at least. And this way we, we reduced the treatment plan, the increased precision, and we also improved communication between specialties because what happens with interdisciplinary treatment is that um, sometimes because of lack of communication, the orthodontist is misguided because he doesn't have any references uh, the prosthodontist is misguided, and then ultimately the implant surgeon also is misguided, and the patient is the one that's uh, suffering all these issues. With digital technology and digital planning, uh, we can improve this communication between specialties or specialists, and ultimately the patient's going to benefit from this uh, communication. And so, as conclusion of the presentation, uh, it's important to build your own team in one office, ideally, if not by referrals, but it, also with referrals, digital technology is uh, gonna give you better communication because you can uh, share screen and share all the images. Um, digital technology allow us to develop new protocols in order to, as we mentioned, enhance precision. And treatment sequence is one of the big uh, things here because we can use this digital technology to diagnose, to treatment plan, and then decide the final treatment sequence between all the specialists, and this way be able to reduce uh, treatment time. And with this, um, I wanna thank you uh, for your attention, and, and I'm ready to have any discussion about the topic. Thank you so much, Gonzalo. I have to say, as I said at the, if at the first part of the presentation, I was pretty sure it will be interesting. And you know, as you published that article, I think this was an era that you, uh, I think, brought it to implant dentistry originally, because some, sometimes people talk about some aspects, but when it's published, when it becomes like a protocol or as a routine, it makes a difference. So. First of all, we are thankful right. for what you did and your team that uh, everyone in different specialties work together. I think it's a, it's a blessing that you have that team with you, that everything happens in one place Definitely. as a family base. So, you know, I think, first of all, if you want, you can stop share because we now have a little discussion. On sure. Uh, you know, uh, when, when we talk about orthodontics, as you said, the main concern for the patients usually is the time. And sometimes, I'm not going to say in all specialists, but sometimes uh, orthodontic treatment cannot be that predictable long term. You know, I'm not going to say predictable, but sometimes patients are having concern about uh, relapse or tooth movement in long term. Now, right. when, you, when you plan the case digitally and you know exactly how you want to move teeth and where you want to place your implants and you do the placement at the beginning so you compact the time, I want to know some scenarios that may happen. Number one, mm -hmm. applicable in all orthodontic treatments or only those no. Tooth movements are limited, or you have enough bone to make sure your implant is going to be in a correct position. So it's a great question, and and it's actually 
it's not applicable to each case. You, you have to select the case really well. Because sometimes when in order to place that you do the digital planning, because it has happened to us with many cases that we wanted to apply this, this protocol. And we go ahead to invest the time on doing the digi digital setup and, and we do the works and we go ahead and place the implant. And we know that they, we, saw, we see that they, this implant is too close to the adjacent tooth, for example. And so um, we cannot place or take that risk of placing the tooth, the implant that close. And also when you print the surgical guide, you have this metal cylinder and you need that space for that metal cylinder. If you don't have that space, you cannot place the implant digitally planned. So it's, you have to select the case really well. It's not applicable to any, every case. And also we have other anatomical limitations, but as, as you saw on, on our la last case, uh, where there was some, also we need some, some GBR, we, we could do that simultaneously to the implant placement. So um, the limitation of, well, it would, if, if there was a need for a big GBR that the implant could not be placed simultaneously, that wouldn't be worth it to do it um, anyways. Yeah. And you know, you also talked about when you were talking about three scenarios that you have available to choose from them and you chose to go with doing everything in one place and then do the orthodontics. You talked also about the question of doing the root coverage or thickening the tissue first or after the orthodontics. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes like a debate or sometimes it's like a controversy. Some people uh, believe in that. Maybe if I move the tooth, all the graft maybe goes apically so I have to do the grafting again. Some people say that, no, we want to increase the tissue thickness so we prevent the re recession in future. So I want to know your experience and what you think in doing the thickening of the tissue process with orthodontics. Is your preference, no matter if you place your implant at the same time or not, but do you prefer to thicken the tissue first and then do the orthodontics and accepting the risk that maybe with labializing the tissue goes apically again, or you prefer to do it afterwards? So it's, it's a great question. And then this, this question is the one that we face on our daily basis, right? This classic adult patient that has recession and now wants to undergo orthodontic treatment. And we also come up with, we always come up with this question of when should I graft, right? Um, and it, it really depends. There's, uh, I, I don't have a preference. I, I also trust on digital technology in these cases. So what we do on these situations, we do the setup and we compare the initial situation with the setup. And we look at the type of tooth movement that's gonna be made. So for example, uh, a patient that presents a, a recession on a lower incisor that's too procline, uh, right? It's outside the outer housing and, and it's procline. And if that digital setup of orthodontic treatment tells us that this tooth is gonna be retrocline and position inside the other housing. Uh, by moving the teeth inside the other housing, we've done it in many cases, and the recession uh, becomes shallower and narrower. And sometimes even the, the soft tissue thickness on the apicolastic becomes a little thicker. So that way we know that the, the more shallow the recession, the greater chance to increase uh, uh, we increase the chances of, of achieving complete root coverage. So uh, many times, if, if the, if the, the uh, orthodontic treatment is going to be uh, in, bringing the teeth inside the outer housing, we do the and the uh, Tooth movement is gonna be proclination of bringing the teeth outside the outer housing. We think of many times doing, as I, we showed on the second case, doing decortications with hard tissue grafting and soft tissue grafting. Because what happens is that when you graft, you're limited by the thickness of your graft, right? You're achieving a, a 1.5 millimeter thick graft and if you get a bigger graft, you know that you have greater chance of, of bleeding in the palate and postoperative complications. 
by adding, for example, an acellular dermal matrix of two millimeter thickness and adding uh, heart tissue graft, you're, you're broadening that, that alveolar housing and you can move the teeth much more outside without taking chances. Although we know that this is a more invasive uh, approach, but we apply this in our daily basis. And if you communicate with the patient and you have these technologies of CBCTs and, and we throw those scans, you can show them, look, your teeth already have recession, heart tissue dehiscence, and they're gonna be brought outside the upper housing. This is the way to go. And if you show them the planning, most of the time they, they accept it. But uh, as I mentioned, if the teeth are gonna be brought outside, then I thicken the tissue somehow with hard or soft tissue or in combination of both. And if another grafting is needed at the end, we may do it as well. But if you do it at the end and you increase the depth of the recession and you bring the teeth out outside the outdoor housing, um, you're gonna have a greater avascular surface that's gonna be much harder to cover. And by bringing the teeth outside the outdoor housing, you're gonna also compromise the blood supply to your graft. So if you do the graft prior to this and you at least cover as much as you can and thicken the tissue and then you bring the teeth outside and you have a small recession at the end, then you retreat the patient. But you communicate with the patient before and you say, hey, we're gonna do this first. We'll do orthotic treatment after. And then we, we will reassess your case. If there's a uh, residual recession, we'll treat it again at the end. That was actually, that was a great point that you mentioned that, especially in those cases that we wanna labialize the teeth uh, we are making the avascular surface more, so the the predictability of our treatment is going to be less after orthos. That was that was a great point. And you know, one of the other things that I maybe maybe it's a question for some of our audiences that, uh, as you said, definitely we need to have a good case selection in this protocol. But uh, as an as a as an example, I want to know in those cases that we have posterior cross bites. Uh, or, or I can say it this way, if we cannot place our implant in a correct three-dimensional position, can we say that doing this approach is going to be limited? And the example definitely. cross bites. Yeah, 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 definitely. So, so for example, um, if the dental expansion, uh, it's going to be um, quite a bit and the implant is going to be has to be placed much more buckly and if you place it more palatally then you're going to compromise the prosthesis then ideally you'll want to place the implant later on at the towards the end or at the end of orthodontic treatment so because we, we've seen in the literature in, in many articles that uh, the shape of the prosthesis is going to affect also the pre-implant health because it's going to compromise the plant stability, right? So if we place the implant uh, towards the palatal, we're, you're going to have a big crown towards the, the buckle and it's going to be impossible to cleanse for the patient. It's the same thing as you place the implant towards the distal and you have a big space or a big black triangle in the mesial, you're going to have more food impaction and, and this way compromise uh, the cleansability. We've seen this in in the latest article, we actually, um, in our university, we published a recent article on, on this topic on journal clinical periodontology, showing that implants that are not cleansable have a greater chance of suffering um, mucositis, perimental mucositis. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Gonzalo, I have to thank you so much for sharing, sharing all these great data and new data with all of us. And, you know, your topic has, as, as I said to some uh, guests prior to you uh, as theirs, you know, some topics are very interesting and we can talk about them like hours and hours and, you know, questions always come to our mind and new ideas, but, but right. I'm just limited. So I want to, first of all, thank you so much for joining, for sharing. It was my pleasure and, and I had a great time and, and we had a great discussion with great points. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And I want to just make it, make this announcement again. Actually, it was back in 2020, but 
Um, we had a chance to have you as one of the guests in the book published by Springer, Integrated Procedures in Facial Cosmetic Surgery in a chapter of Cosmetic Intraoral Surgeries. Dr. Gonzalo Bossi joined us and shared a beautiful case in this book too. And really looking forward to see you very soon, my friend, in Tehran or Same in here. or any ever We're in Barcelona. Sure, definitely. I promise you, I will make it happen in Tehran. So soon. Thanks. But take care, my friend. Thank you again for your time. Stay Same here and say hi to your. Thank you. On my side. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.